Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron Legrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Well, hello, everybody. This is Ron Legrand in another ongoing series of the Mentor Podcast where our mission is to help you make more money, keep more of it, protect more of it, and and when you retire, have a lot of it left over. My special guest today is Lance Edwards, who happens to be the small apartment king, and I'm going to quiz him on why we should enter the small apartment world and what it's really like, not what people think it's like. So I don't know anybody better to tell you who Lance Edwards is than Lance himself. Hello, sir. Hey, Ron. It's, boy, it's great to be here. Appreciate you hosting this. All right. Well, look, uh, you've been around for quite a while, Ron. You were, you know, I worked together. You're in one of our mastermind groups, and and um, we've even taken uh, trips. I've been to your wedding, for crying out loud, so uh, <laughs> I'm not going to tell people about how it's down there in the in the, in the uh, mosquito-infested part of Southwest Florida, anything like that. I wouldn't say anything like that, but... Thank you. Uh, Listen, you're in the small apartment world, and I'm in the single family house world, and I want you to probably, well, first, you probably ought to tell them a little bit about your background, but then I want you to make a case on why someone should consider small apartments. You bet. All right, you bet. Well, thank you so much. And um, uh, f- first of all, you know, I'm the best selling author of the book, How to Make Big Money in Small Apartments. and uh, you know, went best selling a few, few years ago, but I, I got started, you know, back in way in 2002, like many people do in real estate vetting, investing, looking to do my first deal. But I just happened to choose small apartments as a niche um, to get started. The very first deal I did, I bought a fourplex, nothing down, because I want to get the leverage of other people's money. And uh, from that, over the next few years on a part time basis, bought more fourplexes than 10, 50, 56, 85 unit projects, always using other people's money and did that on a part-time basis uh, within three years was able to retire from my 20-year job and doing real estate full-time since 2005 and around 2007 started teaching others how to do the same thing and um, we have a very um, active training business we have a very active transactions and deal making business and we've taught literally tens of thousands nationwide how to get on the path to replacing their job income or enhancing their retirement income through the cash flow of small apartment investing. Um, and so, you know, that's our credentials. I, I love teaching this. Uh, I love doing transactions with students. And, you know, as, as far as the advantages, you know, I could go on and on. I know that you would keep this concise, but, you know, there's a number of really advantages that attracted me into the niche of small apartment investing. Uh, first of all, you, it's, it's more money for the same effort. And generally, you're talking about bigger checks because you've got multiple doors you're dealing with as opposed to this one door. Uh, you can wholesale these small apartment buildings just like you do with wholesaling houses. Uh, it's simply bigger checks, you know, we're talking about ten to fifty thousand dollar checks. And, and apartments, the thing about really about apartments, they're made to cash flow, which means uh, you got one roof with multiple shared walls, one foundation. They are designed to be income producing property. So on a per mm-hmm. door basis, cash flows uh, is just better. And um, a couple other ones I'll share here with you is that you know when you're, when you're holding them for cash flow, you got multiple doors, so you got multiple tenants paying you. So if one person moves out, uh, you're not going. You don't go from 100% to 0% occupancy. You've got other people paying you, so you still got cash flow. And I'll say, I'll say two more things here is that the analysis is all based on the numbers. It's math. It's simple math. Uh, we make offers, do transactions across the country, sight unseen, because it's simply, I don't need to see the property. I need to see the math. And, and one more I would share here is that, uh, you know, you can, I don't want anybody self-managing. So you're not going to be dealing with tenants and toilets. Uh, and you can hire very good professional management companies, especially when you've got multiple doors. There's more revenue, more money to go around and hiring those good management companies. And so, you know, for all those reasons and, and many more I can enumerate, I just decided to get started here. And, and it's really just a switch, a decision um, to do that. 
Well, it's actually not a switch. It's an additional decision. There's no reason people can't be doing single family and multifamily. Oh, and precisely. For that matter. Yeah, you don't give precisely. up one to do the other. Before we go any further, though, I think you better define the term small apartments. Sure. You know, uh, small apartments is two to 30 unit buildings that includes duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes, the residentials, and then five five to 30 on the commercial side. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're not one of these guys that wants to go out and find a 200-unit apartment complex. You're dealing in the small apartments because, in fact, they truly are less competition than a lot more of them, aren't there? Well, there are. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I'll say a couple of things about that. As, you know, I think the most critical deal for anybody getting started is the first deal. Uh, it's also the scariest. And so I, I want to see everyone start small, but you don't have to stay small. You can start small and then scale up once you get that critical first deal under your belt. But uh, in addition to that, the, you know, the point you just hit on, Ron, is that uh, if you get in, when you get into the larger properties, those 200 units and above, you're dealing with institutional sellers and institutional buyers where it's mm-hmm. much rampant in terms of the competition. Down here in small apartments, these are mom and pop owners. None and, of the big uh, boys are looking for the small ones. They're not. N- there's no. no hedge fund going to buy a 20-unit apartment building. Precisely. It's just not worth their time, trouble, and, and money. And probably even more importantly, I don't know if you're going to touch on this or not, uh, in the smaller units, I can get owner financing all day long instead of having oh, to have right. you know, to buy them. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a, a fabulous point. And that's why, you know, my office pretty much focuses you know, almost exclusively on owner finance deals because like, just like you're saying, Ron, it's more comp financing when I'm dealing with the individual owner and with that owner financing. And of course, Ron, you know, this and is you can, I can negotiate the down payment. I can negotiate the interest rate. I can, it's all negotiable. Yeah. And uh, absolutely. And, sometimes, and no bank qualifying. Them, sometimes you just take over existing debt on them subject to, don't you? That's People precisely right. Business and don't learn the management part of it, and decide they don't like it anymore because they actually have to take calls from tenants. And of course, all of that is manageable and controllable and learnable. Because I can tell you from my experience, way way back, they taught me how to buy real estate, but they didn't teach me how to manage it. So it took me a long time to figure that one out. I tell you where I learn: I learn from the tenants. <laughs> yeah, that's property. exactly right. That's, that's, what, that's why I say never, never, never self-manage. You know, you're you know. You're, you're, yeah, we're not very really right. good at it, especially in our world where we are automated and systemized, and uh, we have very little to do because we let other people do the stuff we don't really want to do, and it's for such a small amount of money as well. And 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 I would say I would say this: everything that everything that Ron that you teach with regards to single family about owner financing, the lease options, it transfers over to small apartment buildings. They're, they're sure. the same mom and pop owners. I mean, it's almost identical. The due diligence is a little different going in, but it's almost identical uh, to how we buy them. Correct. And and um, your case, though, sometimes you hold them for longer term, uh, especially if you're working with students who want to do that. And sometimes you just flip them, right? I mean, some people think I'm buying apartments to sit on them for 20 years. That may or may not be true. But uh, uh, a lot of your students just flip them, don't they? Yeah, I mean, the strategy that I that I teach is, you know, the simplest way is, is, you know, flip one, flip one, flip one, hold one. So, you know, we're creating deal flow. We got we, ideas, obviously, how to monetize every prospect that comes or lead that comes across our desk. So, but not every necessarily every property is going to meet our buy and hold criteria. Well, but we can still flip them to someone who would. For example, if it's, if it's a vacant building that's a total rehab, maybe you don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get involved in that, so I flip it to a rehabber. And then along the way, I'm cherry picking the ones that I want to hang on to and add them to my to my portfolio. So flip one, flip one, flip one, hold one. Or ultimately, you get to the point where you hold one, hold one, hold one, hold one, flip none. <laughs> I've yes. Always said that when you, first you take care of today's cash flow needs, but honestly, it won't take but a few apartment buildings, and that's already done in monthly cash flow. And, 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 and you worry about uh, building an empire after your cash flow needs are taken care of. But we get to do both of those simultaneously because your cash flow is almost instant. And as long as your cash flow is there, it makes all the other decisions a lot easier. And plus, we, we quit making chaos management decisions because we're not strapped for cash and we can buy uh, groceries next Friday. So, well, that's, uh, that's, ex- and that's exactly what I teach because I say, you know, you're talking about 
uh, you know, minimum $10,000 on these flips, but, you know, really think in terms of 10 to 50, nominally, like say around 20. And so you can, anyone can do the math. If, if you need $40,000 to replace your job income, that's two deals a year. If you need 60, that's three deals per year. This is part time. And, you know, you do that through the flipping to give yourself some either replacement income or some additional income, take the pressure off, and then you cherry pick and start accumulating until you got enough passive income. You don't need to be wholesaling if you don't choose to. Correct. Now, I read in your book that you emphasize that you're really just a marketing company. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think, I think uh, you know, each of us, I, what I say at each of us in the real estate business, we're really not in the real estate business. We're in the marketing business, meaning uh, if our phone's not ringing, we don't have a business, we have a hobby. And just like any business in a marketing business. And, and so our marketing is I got to find deals and I got to find dollars. And uh, deals, I got to find the motivated sellers, get them under contract. Marketing for dollars means I find either a buyer I'm going to sell this property to, or the dollars means a private investor who's going to lend me the money to buy it. Because, you know, whether it's single family or multifamily, and it's marketing. We got to get leads coming across, and then we figure out how to monetize them as they come across our desk. It's really not hard to sell cash flow, though, is it, Lance? <laughs> you know, <laughs> a few people looking for that. Yeah. Everybody wants cash flow. Yep. Everybody. And so Everybody. Um, I can make the case the best way to sell it is uh, with owner financing. That way you have a monthly income coming in over and above what you're paying out without having to do anything with the property. But and sometimes people come in or stroke you a check. I, so. I, I, I sell buildings that way. And, uh, so just exactly what you're saying. I sell the building. I get a chunk of cash for down payment. They're paying me a monthly mortgage payment. I got passive income, and I don't even know what color the building is anymore because they're the owner. They they take care of it. It's great right. passive income. True, I mean, true, true, true passive income. And the good thing about apartments is that you don't need appraisal because the numbers calculate the value. Why don't you explain to me? I want you to try to teach our listeners how you go about determining the value of a, I don't know, let's call it a 30-unit apartment complex after it's been stabilized, meaning rented up by 95% or so, but I didn't, it's not stabilized right now. It's not stable. Right now, I got, I'm buying it, and I got uh, 15 vacancies, and I got a lousy manager. I uh, got a mom and pop doing it and fighting all the time, doing a crappy job of it and pissing off all our tenants and and that's the reason the place is half vacant like that. But I can buy it like it is, so I can buy it at a deeply discounted price. Now, what do I do to determine what it's worth after I get it stabilized and almost fully rented? Give me the math. Super. Super. All right. So it's simple math. So if you're listening, um, uh, of course, you're listening, but you might want to write this down. But it's really, you can probably follow it straight away. The value of an apartment building is one formula. And it's the value equals the NOI divided by the market cap rate. So the value equals the NOI divided by the market cap rate. Okay, market cap rate is a constant we get by calling brokers. Let's say it's 8%. The NOI, which is the top part of that formula, is the net operating income, is simply the revenue minus the expenses. Revenue being primarily rent, but it could be some other odds and in income, but primarily it's rent, revenue, revenue minus expenses. So market value equals NOI divided by market cap rate. If I want to know the future value at a new NOI, which is, this is called an income-based appraisal, by the way. This is how an appraiser would do it. So all I need to do is figure out, I know the revenue today. Well, what, what will the revenue be if I'm, you know, 70% occupied or 50% occupied today, what will right. the revenue be when I'm 90% occupied? All right, stop now. First of all, you know, I stand for net operating income. Okay, so let's start there and break this apart piece by piece so we don't lose everybody. Okay. In order to figure the net operating income, you start with the gross revenue that you are projecting. And in my case, it was 95% full at rates that we collect from doing our market analysis, what's everybody else with similar units renting for in the area, which you can get on a lot of websites. Yep. Okay. So we start with our income. Now we start deducting our expenses. 
uh, which we usually get from the seller, certainly if there's an agent involved, but if not, better get them from the seller before we go buy a property. But there are a couple expenses that people tend to forget, such as uh, management. Management company. Uh, yeah, you're, you know, when you get one of these from mom and pop, they're managing it themselves, so there's no management number in there, right? Want to not forget that one because you're going to be paying a management fee. Which, what, what do you think that would be on the average? Uh, you should figure 10%. 10%. Okay. And then sometimes there's no vacancy factor in there, but we're, we're already adding it in because we're figuring it 95% occupied. And then people also uh, forget to put in a reserve factor in there. Mom and pop have not put in any kind of reserves. That's setting a little money aside every month. So when you need a new roof or you need a new whatever, a new paint job that uh, the money's in there to do it. And also the expenses do not have anything to do with the interest or the principal on the underlying note, so people forget that as well. So we take the income, we subtract all the real expenses, no depreciation either, and now we get to down what we call the NOI, and it's a very important number, isn't it? Because from that, everything is generated, all right? So we've explained that one. Now I want you to explain uh, the okay. uh, rest of the formula. We got sure. the NOI. Okay, so we've got, oh, we we've got, got NOI, NOI, net operating yeah. income. So yeah. here, here, let me say this. The value of an income-producing property depends upon the income. So mm -hmm. we know the NOI. So the formula is the value equals the NOI divided by the market cap rate. All right. cap I'm going to let you explain that cap rate thing. Good luck with this one. Well, the market cap rate is the return on capital that the market expects to get in that market. And it's, it's set by the marketplace in each particular market. And so, for example, uh, it could be very well be 8% is the market cap rate. That means the market's looking for an 8% return of their capital in an apartment building. Excluding These numbers, any debt. Without any, any debt. debt, without any debt, precisely. Okay. Um, your actual return is gonna be higher, but let's just keep it simple. So. The market cap rate set by the market. These numbers you get by calling commercial brokers in any particular market, and they'll give you the market mm -hmm. cap rate. That's pretty so, much the only way you can get them, isn't it? If you want to talk to appraisers, but you're, you know, it's easier to well, talk to the brokers. Same difference. They're brokers. So it, because it fluctuates from time to time based on the demand in the marketplace for that type of an investment based on the times we're in. Correct. And the more stable the investment, the lower rate of return they're willing to accept. Does that make correct. sense? That's okay. Exactly For example, a class A apartment building is more or less, well, I don't know if it's less risky or not, but apartment buildings, period, are less risky than, say, office buildings. Because I got a lot more tenants. One moves out, it doesn't leave a big hole. So you, generally, would you say office building cap rates uh, People want a higher rate of return. They're going to want a higher rate of return. The more, the more risk there is, the higher the rate of return they're going to want right. on it. Okay. Now, you're going to have to try to explain that as my cap rate goes up, uh, my value isn't going up. All right. So I'll, I'll let you do that. This, this, is, this is the part, and it, everything get, it gets backwards at this point. So just everyone bear with me. So remember our formula. The value equals the NOI divided by the market cap rate. So when the cap rate goes up, the value goes down because of that formula. They're inverse relationships. Let's, so let's, let's explain why. Well, because if I have, uh, again, value equals NOI divided by cap rate, because the cap rate is in the denominator, as that number gets bigger, it's making the value so, go down. I, I think I got it. Let me take a stab at it. Sure. You clean me up. If I'm requiring a 10% rate of return on my investment over an 8% rate of return, that means in order to get a 10% return, I have to pay less for the property. Correct. I'm going to let that sink into everybody. So, uh, so the higher the cap rate, the less I'm paying for the property and the less it's worth. The lower the cap rate, 
the more I'm paying for the property because I'm willing to accept a smaller rate of return for my money. Uh, did that sound right? That's precisely correct. Okay. That's precisely correct. And and I would and I would add to that for everyone that you know when, when we're when you're evaluating apartment buildings and buying apartment buildings, you're not buying you're not buying real estate. You're really you're buying the cap rate. That's what you're buying. Sure. The buyer's looking for a cap rate. You're buying net, net operating income. That's what Correct. you're buying. Cash flow. So uh, really what that means is then that I need to buy at a high or no cap rate because if there's no net profit, there's no cap rate. If the prop- property's losing money, there is no cap rate because there is no return on investment. Correct. So I need to buy at a high or no and then we'll hopefully turn it around and sell it at a low cap rate. That's it. Which is okay. opposite what we've always been taught. Buy low, yep. sell high. Buy low price, sell high price. In apartments is buy high cap rate, sell lower cap rate. Any income producing property. Any, yes. Different cap rates. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So now, now that we totally screwed everybody up. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so again... It is up to you to determine what you think the net operating income will be based on reasonable assumptions. And the key word is reasonable, not pie in the sky crap to make the make the, the spreadsheet look good. And then go into the marketplace to get the cap rate, then do your division, and then you can find out what the future value is. Right? That's exactly it. And the beauty of it is, you know, between the phone, the internet, and a piece of paper, you can do this sight unseen. Yeah, you don't need an appraiser to determine the value of an apartment building. Precisely. But you do need to collect some facts, mainly the expenses and some rent comps. Okay. Um, Do your people uh, renovate apartments and turn them around, or do they mostly flip them, or I guess they do all of the above? Well, they can do all the above, but, you know, those that do renovations, this is an area that's uh, known as forced appreciation. And this is how you quickly boost your net worth um, with uh, rehabbing these apartment buildings because, you know, do that same math and we can go through it if Ron you know, wants to, but do the same math. We can show that if you, when you raise the rents and you raise the occupancy, you're raising the NOI and you're boosting the value of your buildings and the, the ratio without going through the math, is basically this. If you raise the rent $10 a month, you're raising the value of that building $1,200 per door. Per oh, door. No. I, I, I lost that one. All right. Really what you said is if I raise the value, well, let's say we're at a 10 cap because that's easy math. That means we're okay with a 10% rate of return. annually. Yep. So if I raise the rent $10, I've raised the value $100. You've raised it twelve hundred dollars per door. So you've raised. Let's take. Well, that's 10, big, I hear you, but that's ten dollars a month times twelve. Is, is, times twelve. Uh, right. right. Okay. So right, I have. Uh, so per month, if I raise it ten dollars, I've raised the value a hundred dollars times twelve is twelve hundred dollars. Correct. So if I have a thirty unit and I raise everybody's rent ten bucks, I just raise the value twelve hundred dollars a year times thirty. Right, thirty-six thousand dollars. Correct. So just a lousy ten dollar in ten bucks. Yeah. Or if I lower the expenses, every dollar I lower the expenses, I get ten dollars in value. Or right. actually, twelve hundred dollars. Every dollar I lower the expenses, I get one hundred twenty dollars in value over the course of a year. That makes sense. No, it should be one dollar to Something twelve. Like one dollar yeah, okay. twelve. Yeah. Twelve dollars. All right. Well, there's you know, I like to add extra zero. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so so okay, so it's all about the math and that's what makes it easy to uh work in the world. In fact, any commercial property, it's all about the math. And that's all that same math will kill a lot of deals going in too, because people take trying to take advantage of us and make and you know, looking for greater fools who don't understand our math. And, and that is the, precisely the point. That's precisely the point. And you said it earlier, knowing you know, what's reasonable in terms of the math. And, of course, someone who's trying to sell us the building is going to try to sell us on crazy math. Yeah. So we, we got to know what we're looking at. And in that regard, if I'm looking to buy it undervalued, 
which I am, I, I don't want to pay full retail price for anything. So my goal is to buy it broken and fix it. Then anytime somebody comes at me and they want to sell me an apartment complex with a seven cap, I don't need to know anymore. They're selling right. to me a retail price. There ain't no sense yeah. of me even looking at the details. That's why it's so important that y'all understand what this cap rate thing is. Uh, again, now if somebody comes at me and they want to sell it to me at a 12 cap, you know, I might have interest. But if they want to sell it to me because they don't have a cap, I have more interest because I can create more value by turning it around and fixing it. And or what if I don't want to turn around and fix it? I'll sell it to somebody that can and still get a much bigger profit because they have a bigger spread as well. Precisely. Uh, so you um, you actually have a system where you find deals for your students and you sell deals for your students, don't you? Yeah, we've, uh, you know, because the thing about what we just went through is because it's, it's driven by math. And um, we, we're doing transactions across the country and uh, we've systematized it. In t- you know, t- we're, we're all in the marketing business. We've systematized the marketing. So we have a marketing system for getting sellers. We even have my team gets on the phone to qualify them. And then when we're flipping them, we have a marketing system to attract buyers. And my phone team talks to those buyers to qualify them. And and we close the transactions because, and my background is systems related prior to getting into real estate. So because we're in the marketing business, it all can be systematized. So it doesn't have to be your time. And this was great about Ron and same similar to the systems you have, Ron, with regards mm-hmm. to you know taking the the minutia off of our table because we don't we don't have right. time for this stuff. Uh, and right, so you got a system for finding them. You got a system for selling them. Basically, you just plug and play. Correct. And the students want to get involved, you just plug and play into your system, and you, you do most of the work for them, right? That's exactly right, Matt. We call it the plug and play program. You do? Yeah. I, I thought I made that up. No, oh, you're close. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, I know you got a book called Making It Big in Small Apartments, and I know you're going to give that away to our listeners, aren't you? You want to describe what's in that book? Sure. This is my best-selling book, uh, How to Make Big Money in Small Apartments. It explains everything about the business, including the math, the cap rate, the marketing aspect, the exit strategies. and you know, it's a best-selling book. Matter of fact, I'm, you know, very pleased and was you know, blessed. Ron wrote the forward for it. And, uh, and it's a uh, number one bestseller. I want to give it to everyone for free. Um, you get a book for free, just pay, you know, small shipping and handling. And there's a website. You can get the book right now. And by the way, there's over 40 case studies of students, like clients, using their stories to make the point about how anyone can get started with no prior experience using none of their own cash and none of their own credit and doing transactions all over the country, not in their, their own backyard. So to go get the free book, go to the uh, website. It's www.thementorpodcast.com slash multifamily, thementorpodcast.com slash multifamily. We'll get that shipped right out to you. Yeah, that's the mentor now. Don't forget the the. The mentor right. podcast. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, again, if you want to learn what's going on in Ron's world, you know where to find me, ronlegrand.com or ronsfreebook.com. If you want to get my book on, on single family houses, you can set it there beside Lance's. And uh, I think our our pictures are both on the front cover and you can see which one of them uh, <laughs> has the handsomest face. Of course, I already know the answer, Lance. And, and uh, you can get my wholesaling course at uh, ronsdollardeal.com for a dollar. Join our Gold Club for a 30-day free trial. So uh, with that said, Lance, is there any parting words you want to give our audience before we end this podcast today? Uh, I would simply say that, um, you know, for everyone listening, no matter what your experience level is, no matter your financial situation, everyone is qualified to get started in small apartments. There's no reason not. Don't let anything hold you back. Just just decide to get started, get the book, and you can see for yourself how anyone can do this. So thank you, Ron. That's kind of the hardest part of any uh, project, isn't it, getting started? That's it. Yeah, well, all right. Well, sir, I appreciate you taking the time to give us your wisdom today, and thank you, everybody, for listening to the Mentor Podcast, and there are more coming, so stay tuned. So thanks, Mr. Edwards. See you soon. 
That's all for this edition of the Mentor Podcast. To connect with Ron and learn how you can attain financial freedom, as well as up-to-date strategies to grow and protect your wealth based on today's discussion, go to www.connectwiththementor.com.